Dr. Dennis Britton is an associate professor of English with the University of New Hampshire. His research interests include early modern English literature, especially the literature of William Shakespeare and Edmund Spencer, Protestant theology, critical race theory, and the history of emotion. Dr. Britton is the author of Becoming Christian, Race, Reformation, and Early Modern English Romance, written in 2014, and co-editor with Melissa Walter of Rethinking Shakespeare, Source Study, Audiences, Authors, and Digital Technologies in 2018. He's also the co-editor with Kimberly Cole, Coles of a special issue of the Journal of Spencer's Studies on Spencer and Race. Dr. Britton is currently working on two books. He's a pretty busy guy. As a matter of fact, I think he just got done teaching another class uh, entitled Shakespeare uh, and Pity, Feeling Human Difference in the Early Modern Stage and Reforming Ethiopia, African Anglo Relations in Protestant England. Dr. Britton currently serves on the board of directors of the Black Heritage Trail and in full disclosure on the board of directors of New Hampshire Humanities. We could not be more thankful for his participation and support of us. Uh, Dr. Britton, the stage is yours and we thank you for it. All right, by now I should know how to unmute myself. Um, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. Uh, thank you both Tricia and Tony for uh, also Anthony for all the work that you have done to make this Black Thought series possible and um, bringing uh, Black Thought um, in a very public way to the citizens of New Hampshire and folks beyond. I have some some friends from other places um, in the country who are signed on tonight, so it's nice to see you all out there on in Zoom land. All right, um, with that, let me pull up my PowerPoint. Okay. All right, so reading Shakespeare while black. I'm Dennis Britton I'm from the UN University of New Hampshire. There's my Twitter handle and I also have the hashtag shake race um, because um, there is just a beautiful, wonderful, vibrant community on Twitter of folks devoted to the study of race in and through Shakespeare. Um, and I you know, continue to be inspired and learn from them. Um, and I would not be able to do this talk even without leaning upon and drawing from and reading from the work of many of the scholars who are part of this community. Um, so this is a shout out to all my Shakes Race family. Um, I love you all and I thank you all for the work that you are doing uh, with and through Shakespeare. So that guy. So I thought I would begin this presentation um, with a little bit about myself um, because I read Shakespeare and I am black. Um, so um, I figured that you know I might be an, an example of some of the things that I'm going to talk about, as well as you know using a little bit of my own experience to frame um, what is to follow. So I am not a lifelong lover of Shakespeare. You know, a lot of times I speak with Shakespeareans and, you know, they fell in love with Shakespeare in the third grade when they played, you know, Puck or somebody or a fairy in a Midsummer Night's Dream. I am not a lifelong lover of Shakespeare. I um, mean, if someone had told my younger self um, that I would be writing about and teaching Shakespeare, I would have told them to just say no to drugs because clearly they are high. Um, Clearly I am also a child of the 80s and 90s. Um, but um, Shakespeare, this is what Shakespeare was to me, right? When I was, particularly when I was forced to read him in high school. Um, I think many people, not everybody, some people read Shakespeare in high school and you know they loved him. For me, Shakespeare was boring and there wasn't much that anyone could do to change my mind. The words didn't make any sense. The plots were unrealistic or unbelievable. And they had little to do with the things that I cared about growing up as a black kid in a middle-class suburb of Los Angeles. It wasn't until I got to college and majored in English and was forced, and I will say forced, I was forced. It was a requirement at the University of Southern California where I did my undergraduate. And when I was forced to take Shakespeare, that my mind began to change. Um, I took Shakespeare with um, Professor Heather James there, you know, shout out to her. 
And she had a kind of uphill battle, not that she knew it or not that she cared, but I went into this class not particularly thinking I was going to enjoy it um, or like it, but I was there because I had to get my degree. Shakespeare was just one of those guys that we were, I was told that was important and someone that I needed to study to be a real English major. That being said, there was one play that actually changed my thinking around Shakespeare. Um, and of all the things that I read, um, this is it's the discussion of Shakespeare's measure for measure. And this is not a play that many people know. It's not one that people often read in high school, if at all. It's not even one that students often read in college. So some of that has changed because it, um, in more recent years and recently, because there's a lot of ways in which you can talk about this play in connection with the Me Too movement. But that's another topic for another day. Um, it was upon reading this play that my thinking about Shakespeare began to change a little bit. Um, my professor asks us, asked us to read Shakespeare in conjunction with, or she introduced us to the idea or the philosophy of the philosopher Jeremy Bentham and his panopticon. So the panopticon, the Greek from uh, the, the Greek word for all seeing, is a type of institutional building. Um, again, this is from the 18th century or was, um, um, so after Shakespeare, so this is not, I'll get there in a second, after Shakespeare from the 18th century. But the idea that panopticon is that all prisoners can, can be seen from a single guard tower in the middle of the institution. Um, it, is no, it is not at all possible that the guard can keep an eye on every prisoner all the time in all of the cells. However, the very thought that you might be being watched is enough, according to Bentham and to this, this design, enough to make the prisoners regulate their behavior. And here at the very bottom is an actual um, panopticon prison that was um, from, you know, a now abandoned panopticon prison um, from in Cuba built in the early part of the 20th century. Now, the reason Professor James asked us to think about Bentham's panopticon is because in Measure for Measure, we have a duke who disguises himself as a friar. And as a friar, he has access to move throughout the play, meet a variety of characters, and also learn all the characters' deepest secrets and sins, all while under the disguise of a as, of, uh, all as he is disguised as a friar. It is at the end of the play, however, that he reveals himself as the Duke and pretty much says, I know all of your sins. I know what you did. I know everything that you've done. And the analogy between the play and the panopticon that Professor James was asking us to consider is the Duke really is an example of the way in which state power attempts to produce self-regulating citizens. Um, it is the threat that we might be being watched, right? Whether we are being watched or not, but the very idea that we might be being watched is enough to keep us acting the way the law, the state access asks us to do. And this is really true. I don't know about you all, I'm so I digress just a little bit. I'm gonna get back to Shakespeare in a minute, but I've often seen these signs, speed limit uh, enforced by aircraft. And on the one hand, you're like, really? Like, am I, is my, you know, is there really an aircraft, you know, monitoring how fast I'm going? I mean, of course, since then, you know, there's been, you know, quite a few memes um, related to this particular, you know, phenomenon, you know, that somehow, you know, a, a armed um, militarized helicopter is going to come and pursue you or shoot you down if you go five miles over the speed limit. Um, but I'll tell you the truth. Um, if I see that, I'm definitely going to check my odometer, right? And I'm, and I'm likely going to slow down, right? Whether or not I am actually being monitored by aircraft, the thought that I might be being monitored by aircraft is enough for me to make me slow down and sort of think about what I'm doing. So anyways, this is what, you know, um, reading Shakespeare alongside the Panopticon allowed me to think about as an undergraduate. And it really made me think about, huh, Shakespeare might allow me to understand 
my present world and why I act the way I do in my present world. Um, but it was because my professor made Shakespeare matter, right? Um, she highlighted the politics behind the plays or the politics that might inform a reading of a play. And that for me made a, a, made a difference. Later, I would become interested in the plots and the love and the, um, the love stories and, uh, and the language in particular. But for me, this was the thing that really grabbed my attention. All right. But I believe, I've kind of gotten the heart of myself. Um, but for me, Shakespeare is worth studying because he might have within him, if read with the right perspective, some radical potential. And this is the potential that numerous black writers have seen in him. So in a 1984 lecture at Rutgers University, Amiri Baraka, who was most associated with the black arts movement of the 1960s and 70s, told his students this. If the people that rule this country thought they could, uh, thought you could understand what Shakespeare's really saying, they would remove Shakespeare from us. Shakespeare, if you really penetrate what he's saying, the reality of what the drama is, you will you see that Shakespeare is revolutionary for that period. So I do want to just you know focus a little bit on the tenses that uh, Baraka uses. Shakespeare is a revolutionary for that period, right? So he does sort of you know locate the revolutionary quality in the past, right? That is not so much that Shakespeare is revolutionary to us still today, but in reading Shakespeare, we can get in touch with a history of the revolutionary. Um, and if we are in touch with a history of the revolutionary, even being in touch with that history is potentially dangerous to the status quo. Um, if we really understood Shakespeare, if we really got in touch with the ways in which he and his plays are revolutionary, Shakespeare would be something dangerous to be studied by students. For me, Baraka forms many of the ways in which I approach Shakespeare today and think about him. You know, not so much that he is revolutionary today in 2020, um, but in him, we might be able to see something that was revolutionary and translate that reimagine that to fit our own context to think about the types of revolutions that we need today. A little bit more biography. So after undergraduate, somehow I got sold on um, the early modern period, the English Renaissance. Shakespeare part of it, but not solely Shakespeare. So I ended up going to um, America's Dairyland for graduate school. And this picture represents some of what <laughs> American Dairyland <laughs> was like for me when I moved there. Uh, it definitely um, is a good representation of my feelings about America's Dairyland. Um, but I went to America's Dairyland, uh, AKA the University of Wisconsin for graduate school for both an MA and PhD in English. I went to there and um, here is a lovely scene um, from the University of Wisconsin. The English department is actually right on the other side of that building there. But this scene actually plays a really pivotal role in my development and my sort of consciousness as of being black while reading Shakespeare. On my very first day as a graduate student, um, and actually one of my um, classmates um, who was in that very that class with me is actually on Zoom tonight. And right after new student orientation, we went down to the terrace. Um, the University of Wisconsin sits right on Lake Mendota. We went down the terrace to meet and mingle with other graduate students. You know, we do the sort of, you know, standard chit chat. Who are you? Where are you from? What are you studying? What are you specializing? And all of my classmates, they seemed nice enough. But one interaction really stood out to me. Amongst all the sort of standard chit chat, I remember being in a group with one particular um, white male graduate student who was a couple years ahead of me. And he asked me the obligatory question, what are you here to study? I say Shakespeare, Spencer, the literature, 
of the English Renaissance. He says, or he responds to that, you know not a lot of black people study that. And I said, well, I don't know, actually I don't remember what I said, but I do remember being shocked. Um, and on the one hand, what he said was not necessarily at all not in line with my own assumptions. I did not go to graduate school assuming that there were a lot of black people who studied Shakespeare. At that time, I actually did not even know that there were black Shakespeare scholars out there. Now I do know, and there's a great community um, that I'm a part of, but at that time, I didn't know any of them. Um, I don't even think I had read any of their work. I didn't read any of their work until I got to graduate school, actually. So although he said, although his words did not necessarily stand in, in a contrast or um, they did not oppose my own assumptions, the fact that he felt the need to say that was surprising to me um, and problematic because no one ever says, wow, a lot of white people study Shakespeare, right? But there's something seemingly remarkable about a black person studying and reading Shakespeare. However, white people studying Shakespeare is completely unremarkable. Now, now that I've sort of, you know, know a little bit about Shakespeare and a little bit about, you know, the history of Shakespeare criticism and, you know, I've become more and more interested in what black folks have said about Shakespeare, I actually know that what he said is actually couldn't be farther from the truth. Black people for a long time in this country have in fact read and studied Shakespeare. Um, that it is actually not all that remarkable that black people study Shakespeare. Uh, and part of the, this presentation is introducing you all to just a few black folks who have read Shakespeare. Although it is unremarkable that black people study Shakespeare, I would however suggest that black folks and other people of color and other people on the margins do quite remarkable things with Shakespeare. So I would like to begin with a very well-known, often discussed example of um, a prominent black figure having something to say about Shakespeare. So I will begin with W.E.B. Du Bois's um, statements, the often discussed statements in the uh, from the souls of black folks. Du Bois writes, I sit with Shakespeare and he winces not. Across the color line, I move arm and arm with Balzac and Dumas, where smiling men and welcoming women glide in gilded halls. From out of the caves of evening that swing between the strong limbed earth and traces of stars, I summon Aristotle and Aurelius, and what so I will, and they come all graciously with no scorn nor condescension. So, wed with truth, I dwell above the veil. Is this the life you grudge us, O knightly America? Shakespeare is mentioned first among a number of well-esteemed authors and thinkers. Du Bois begins by stating that while white Americans, white Americans might wince at the sight of a black man being so intimate with their great literary author, Shakespeare, however, does not wince. Du Bois paints scenes of intimacy between himself and the authors and thinkers so esteemed by white Americans. He transgresses the color line through sitting with Shakespeare, walking arm in arm with Balzac and Dumas, by summoning through his own volition, Aristotle, Aurelius, and as he says, whoever he darn well likes. Du Bois ends with a rhetorical question. Is this the life you grudge us, O knightly America? Given all the values and ideals that America says it espouses, how can America begrudge black people reading the very authors that they esteem. Yet Du Bois is very well aware that there seems to be something remarkable about the fact that he would sit with Shakespeare and the fact that one like him, a black man, a black person can be so intimate with him. Yet part of what Du Bois wants is for all of us to move beyond the veil, beyond the color line 
and to make it unremarkable. Shakespeare was also commonly read in 19th, late 19th and early 20th century African-American reading clubs. Though as far as I have known is, you know, this is not a subject that I know a lot about. I've just, I've done some reading on this. But as far as I can tell, most of these clubs or these clubs were not devoted solely to Shakespeare. Shakespeare instead was part of a larger curriculum of reading classics, um, classical literature, um, and all as part of a project of racial uplift. In an 1895 essay, from the Boston-based Black periodical, Black women's periodical, Women's Era, era the black, black women are given the following advice, that they should read not about authors and imagine you have read the authors themselves, but with great care, study and masters, the masters of arts, of the art of literature, author, authors like Milton, Dante, Shakespeare, Bacon, Goethe, Cervantes, Schiller, and others. It is just, it is not enough for black women, according to the um, publishers of this magazine, it is not enough for black women just to know about these authors and have read about them secondhand. They need to know them for themselves and they need to study them. The authors, all of this for them is part of a project of racial uplift. It's all incorporated into a project of advancement linked to education. But we know that there is at least one black woman's reading club that was inspired um, by Shakespeare. This is the Arden Club of Topeka, Kansas. And here we have a clip of a newspaper article from the Topeka Plain Dealer, and this is from November of 1899. So, and uh, there were lots and lots of um, Black women's reading clubs in Topeka, but this is just one of them. Among the many clubs which this fair city boasts, the Arden Club is probably one of the best known, smallest, hardworking, and youngest. It was organized two years ago last June for the study, for the study of, uh, study Shakespeare's plays. The name Arden was not taken from Tennyson's Enoch Arden as it is supposed by some of our friends, which I already think is funny, you know, they know Tennyson too. They don't just know Shakespeare. These are black women, they know Tennyson. Um, as is supposed by some of our friends, but from the forest of Arden in As You Like It. We also had in mind the fact that Shakespeare's mother's maiden name was Mary Arden. So they are really showing a, a, a rather deep knowledge of Shakespeare, right? It, it is very thought out. Um, they are showing an extensive knowledge of, of English literature, and they even know the fact of Shakespeare's mother's name. They go on, we get a little bit more of the description of what this club looked like and the types of things that they read. The course so far has included the comedies Twelfth Night, As You Like It, Tempest, Two Gentlemen of Verona, much Ado About Nothing and A Midsummer Night's Dreams, and the tragedies Macbeth, Hamlet, Romeo and Juliet, Julius Caesar, and Antony and Cleopatra. So this gives us a sense of, um, of what they've been reading. Um, in some of the research I've done, or this is other people's research, they've noted sort of maybe surprisingly, um, Othello doesn't often appear on the list of, of these, you know, we, you know in, much, in as much as we have records from these reading clubs, Othello seems to be interestingly absent, you know, uh, why that is Othello, you know, the, the Shakespeare, you know, the, the tragedy, you know, of a black man who marries a white woman and it doesn't go well. Um, why that play is absent from these reading lists um, is a, a topic to be further considered, maybe. But we also learn a little bit more about As You Like It. This As You Like It, the play, you know, a play in which, you know, girl meets boy, girl follows boy into the forest cross-dressed as a boy, falls in love with the boy, boy thinks boy is a girl, it's all types of crazy. But you know, th but that's the as you like it. But as you like it, um, at this time being read for the second time is being a favorite of the clubs for several reasons. For whatever reason, as you like it is a favorite and they do give us some sense of why. Um, 
in the Forest of Arden by the Reverend Hamilton Maybe is being read in connection with it, right? So they're doing some comparative reading here, right? Um, Maybe's uh, novel, which I, I don't, I've never read, but from when I've sort of looked into, it's a story of two young lovers who go on a vacation, right? And it sort of has some connection to As You Like It. So they're doing some, you know, putting, they're doing some intertextual reading, as we would say. They're putting these two texts in conversation with each other. It is the intention to begin the English historical plays in this, uh, this winter. Supplementary reading in English history, right? They're doing background reading. Supplemental readings in English history will accompany the reading of each play. The Arden Club's aim is to find tongues in trees, books in running brooks, sermons in stones, and good in everything. Um, and that is a quote from As You Like It. So their, the mission or one of the goals or aims of this organization comes from Shakespeare's As You Like It, or it is aligned with Shakespeare's play, the, this, which seems to be the particular favorite play or is the favorite play of this particular reading club. So Black women's readings groups saw Shakespeare as a means of advancing the race, of showing that Black people could have a mastery of the very things that whites um, had mastered, right? That they could be just as cultured as white folks. But as times change and as understandings of racial equality change, as well as understandings of what it meant to be Black within America change, attitudes and responses to Shakespeare also change. In his 1964 essay, Why I Stopped Hating Shakespeare, James, James Baldwin writes, every writer in the English language, I should imagine, has at some point hated Shakespeare, has turned away from the monstrous achievement with a kind of sick envy. In my most anti-English days, I condemned him as a chauvinist, this England indeed. And because I felt it so bitterly anomalous, that a black man should be forced to deal with the English language at all, should be forced to assault the English language in order to, uh, in order to be able to speak, I condemned him as one of the authors and architects of my oppression. Again, in the ways that some Jews bitterly and mistakenly, so we can argue about that today, mistakenly resent Shylock, I was dubious about Othello. What did he see in Desdemona? and bitter about Caliban. His great vast gallery of people whose reality was as contradictory as it was an unanswerable, unspeakably oppressed me. I was resenting, of course, the assault on my simplicity. And in another way, I was a victim of that loveless education which causes so many schoolboys to detest Shakespeare. But I feared him too feared him because in his hands, the English language became the mightiest of instruments. No one would ever write that way again. No one would ever be able to match, much less surpass him. Baldwin responds to Shakespeare on a number of levels here and in the essay at large. How can he, or how can any writer of any race compete with the greatness of Shakespeare? But Baldwin soon turns to what it means to be a Black man existing under the shadow of Shakespeare, having the English language violently forced upon him, having Shakespeare's English violently forced upon him. Baldwin notes that Shakespeare wrote some very problematic characters. I mean, it seems that, you know, he doesn't necessarily believe that, you know, Shylock is problematic. He sort of has his mind changed. But um, he notes that there are some questions, right? That, there are some problems with the, with the characters Shylock, Othello, and Caliban, to name a few. Baldwin, after this point, goes on to note that things began to change when he heard Shakespeare, what he says for the first time, which is an experience that was completely independent of having been taught Shakespeare, right? So, you know, there's an emphasis between the way in which he encounters Shakespeare outside of the educational system and the way in which Shakespeare is forced upon him um, uh, through, 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 you know, through, through school. 
By the end of the essay, Baldwin has comes to terms and has a kind of understanding of Shakespeare um, and with the English language itself. But his relationship with Shakespeare changes and the English language changes after living in France. Um, and here are two other quotes from Baldwin's essay, beginning to show us the ways in which his attitude towards Shakespeare and the English language change. My quarrel with the English language has been that the language reflected none of my experience. But now I begin to see the matter is quite the matter quite another way. If the language was not my own, it might be the fault of the language, but it might also be my fault. Perhaps the language was not my own because I had never attempted to use it, had only learned to imitate it. If this was so, that it might be made to bear the burden of my experience, if I could find the stamina to challenge it and me to test it. So Baldwin is really reflecting upon the ways in which English literature shapes or has shaped our understanding and our approach and the way in which language acts upon us, right? So as a, want, as a user of English, the only models he has are the models that are so often esteemed in white America, Shakespeare, of course, being the mightiest of them. But once he begins to wrestle with the English language, or he begins to see that the English language is something that he can wrestle with, his ideas about language and afterwards Shakespeare change, that perhaps there is space within the English language to represent his own experience, right? So for him, the problem with Shakespeare and the problem with the English language is that up into, you know, to that point, the English language did not represent, English literature or literature written in English for the most part did not represent his experience. It is with this understanding that he is able to come to terms with Shakespeare noting that the greatest poet in the English language found his poetry where poetry is found in the lives of people. And if poetry is found in the lives of people, Baldwin then realizes and then believes that he can be like Shakespeare to some extent. He is just as capable. Um, he doesn't say this directly, but this is what I'm gleaning from him. Um, but if poetry, if the English language, if what makes English poetry and the English language great is its ability to represent experience, the lives of people, Shakespeare did that and he does it too, he can do it. And of course he does it very well for anyone who's read Baldwin. Um, if you don't, if you haven't read him, your mind will be blown. Like Baldwin, the poet Nikki Giovanni also reflects upon her position as a writer in relationship to Shakespeare. And um, Bald uh, Giovanni also like Baraka is often associated or you know, a really important poet within the black arts movement of the 1960s and 70s. In a 1990 essay entitled Giovanni on Shakespeare, which would later be expanded and incorporated into a collection of essays entitled Racism, or sorry, Racism 101. So that's actually I already think it's really interesting that she writes a, an essay on Shakespeare and it is included in a, in a collection called Racism 101, as if it's like, here's your first semester university primer to this topic. Shakespeare plays a part in our sort of basic understanding of racism, um, Giovanni would suggest by including this essay in that collection. Um, Giovanni has this to say about Shakespeare. Shakespeare is lucky. There is an old African saying, you are not dead until you are forgotten. Many groups share that, so do American Indians. The Euro-American must believe it because he works so hard to keep his history alive. It's fine by me. I hope, like Shakespeare, to one day be a Jeopardy subject. I hope high school seniors quake at the fact that they have to take Giovanni before they graduate. Giovanni imagines a world, right? Imagines a future where she can be just as enshrined in the English language, in the world of, of high esteemed literary authors as someone as Shakespeare, right? That students, like just as I was forced to take Shakespeare as an undergraduate, 
students might be forced to take a whole class devoted to Nikki Giovanni. Giovanni, however, notes that this is unlikely given that Shakespeare and his popularity or his entrenchment, his sort of fundamentalness or his underseen fundamentalness, his necessity that we must all read him cannot be separated from the Euro-American um, devotion to keeping its own history alive, right? That Shakespeare continues and maintains his place because Euro-Americans, as, as she calls them, have insisted, right? That Shakespeare's place cannot be separated from the history of racism and the, um, um, and the elevation and displacement, the elevation of white history, white culture, white ideas, and the erasure of black history, black culture, and black ideas, right? So Shakespeare is completely inseparable from that. Shakespeare is popular because, and necessary because white people, those in power have said that he is necessary. She doesn't blame Shakespeare. Later on in the essay, she says, well, Shakespeare was writing for the people. And I think sort of interestingly enough that there are some similarities between um, Giovanni and Baldwin in the sense that both these authors really sort of attach, um, you know, if they're attracted to Shakespeare at all, they're attracted to the sort of everyday lives that Shakespeare um, makes visible. Or I think we have a sort of sense that, you know, like there is a sort of bad cliche that Shakespeare is universal and somehow that everybody can find themselves in them. And there's been a lot of conversation about that, the way in which universal experience usually just means white experience and usually white male, you know, add a whole bunch of other categories behind that experience. But I think for Baldwin and Giovanni that, they're, that they don't see in Shakespeare these ideas of, uni, of the universal, but they're really sort of locating that you know, Shakespeare was sort of writing for the people of his day. He was writing about you know, you know, the everyday folks. Of course, he was writing about kings and queens and all that stuff, but he was also writing about the everyday experiences of love and conflict um, and human relationships that were particular and pertinent to the people of their day. And if that is the case, if that is what Shakespeare was doing, then of course, why would we see anything at all problematic or wrong with, clearly I'm not moving enough. All right, I've been in my office, the lights went off. <laughs> um, if, if that is what Shakespeare is doing, Baldwin and Giovanni are doing similar in their own works. Last but not least, I'll say something about Toni Morrison um, because um, often, for good or for bad, um, she has often been compared to Shakespeare. Um, and um, Carla Kaplan, Davis Distinguished Professor of English of American Literature at Northeastern University, and a you know after you know the, all the various tributes that went out about her after her death had this to say that Toni Morrison has done for the American novel what Shakespeare did for the theater, right? That you know Shakespeare wrote plays and the you know English theater was forever changed. Um, and Kaplan says that you know once Morrison wrote the wrote the novel, the modern novel has been forever changed. And, and scholars have also pointed out various aspects of more of Shakespeare and allusions to him allusions to him in a variety of his works. But I just wanna say a couple of words about her 2011 play, Desdemona, which is a radical reimagining of Shakespeare's Othello, a play that prior to uh, Morrison, I don't think I actually really understood. Right? I feel like there's a way in which once I read, I've never had the, the, the good pleasure to see um, the performance. But I felt like once I read Morrison's play, I understood what was at stake, what was a problem, um, what might even be useful to think through in ways that I hadn't before, right? So it's a literary work, but she's doing a lot of really, you know, she brings a lot to help us really understand Shakespeare, I would argue, um, through the play itself. Um, and I wanna just show a, a brief cl a clip of Morrison talking about Desdemona. So I'm gonna re pull up a different screen now. We'll hear Toni Morrison 
talk about Othello in her own when words. When Peter Sellers said, I would never do Othello, ever. And I said, why not? And he said, it's so thin. You know, it's nothing there. And I said, no, that's not true. I said, the performances <laughs> may be thin. Because they're all the same. You know, young white girl, black guy, you know, two days over. <laughs> but I said, this is a really extraordinary character. Both of them. Not for the obvious reasons. I think about it. What is this, 14? hundreds or something, Venice, she runs away from home. She runs away from home. She should be in a convent or jail or something. I mean, nobody runs away from home from that class. And uh, she's turned down everybody that they've offered to her as a husband. And they obviously just want the money. But nevertheless, she says no. She meets this one guy. He starts telling her stories. She's breathless. And then they run away and get married. She goes to war with him. She meddles in his business. You know, she's not this little, oh, just a mom. You know, I saw her as stronger, more complex, more interesting than the performances I had seen. And that's what I saw, actually. In the play, I think I may have been thinking about it as an actress. I mean, a bad actress, but still, what? How? <laughs> how would it? How can you? How can you perform Desdemona with some interest other than the way I normally see her performed on stage? Okay. Back to the PowerPoint. All right. Right. So one of the things that I see in Morrison is a real desire to pull out of Shakespeare. And I feel like this is what a lot of the um, Black authors and writers that I've been interested do is they pull out of Shakespeare what is there but not there. Um, Shakespeare did not quite get the story right, right? Or he didn't sort of provide us with everything that we would need to fully understand the situations and the, um, the problems that the plays are exploring, right? Now, of course, I think, you know, part of that, you know, these authors are also noticing the historical difference, right? Um, that, you know, although that these stories might have made sense in Shakespeare's day, but for us today in the 20th century, or in this case now the 21st century, right, that these stories on their own do not, cannot, do not, and maybe cannot speak to us as fully in the ways that we need them to speak to us, right? So Black authors add to, they revise, they provide commentary on Shakespeare. And again, I think all for a, you know, again, you know, there, of course, there are various ways in which, you know, these are only a sampling, but, but as a way of sort of pulling out what might be revolutionary, right, in Shakespeare's works. What, you know, Morrison's play is really gorgeous because it, it really does really ask us to rethink in some really profound ways the intersections of, of, of race and sexism, particularly in the, in the sort of connections between white women and black women. Um, the story centers around Desdemona and her black uh, woman, uh, um, uh, servant or enslaved black woman, Saran, right? So um, a character who is only mentioned in passing by Shakespeare. But Morrison says, wait a minute, who is that black woman that is on the margins of Shakespeare's play? What is her relationship with Desdemona, right? And how do their lives interact and intersect with each other? So for me, and again, the reasons that I really like thinking about Shakespeare alongside or through um, what these and other Black writers say about Shakespeare 
is because they allow me to sort of think about Shakespeare differently. They allow me to sort of think about the ways in which Shakespeare might still be relevant today. You know, we can read Shakespeare, there's definitely beauty and you know, in turns of phrases, and there's definitely some interesting stories and plot lines. But if we want Shakespeare to continue to matter, we have to make him matter. And if we want a Shakespeare to matter, I would suggest that Black people, the disenfranchised, and all those on the margins have a particular power and a place in doing so. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Britton. Uh, questions can uh, go in the chat or you can use the raise hand feature, which is um, you'll see if there's three ellipses, three dots after your name, um, you should be able to raise your hand in there. Um, Professor Britton, could you unshare your screen? So yes, can... yes, yes. Let me do that. Of course. Thank you. I got a, I received a question already from uh, from Reggie. He wants to know how are Shakespeare's neologisms similar to those created by hip hop artists? Oh, <laughs> well, that's a great question, right? I think um, similar or, uh, or, or similarly empowered, right? To be creative and inventive with language, right? So of course Shakespeare, you know, if he didn't have a word or a phrase, he made it up. Right, he had, there was no sort of sense that the English language was so fixed, right? We, I mean, I think we have some rigidity. You know, I'm an English professor, right? And all day, <laughs> I mean, you know, it's I just finished grading a batch of first year English, you know, I just, I'm teaching English, first year English this semester. And I just finished correcting a bunch of first year papers in which I like circled every comma <laughs> error and said, um, you know, things like, um, you know, that's, you know, cannot is one word, not two words. So the one and I'm like enforcing all this rigidity, but you know, apart from that, right, that we do have these sort of understandings of the, the English language of having a, a type of rigidity that both Shakespeare and hip hop artists do not, right? Mm -hmm. um, that the, the language is open, right? The language is there to be used for our purposes, right? Um, for expression. Um, and again, I think, you know, back to Baldwin, that um, although that the English language can have a, a, you know, there can be some tyranny that is associated with as if we are only trying to imitate it, if we're using that language to, you know, really express and to communicate and represent different experiences, experiences that have not to this point, right, you know, um, or, you know, I think in, in terms of, you know, this, this, in terms of you know what is often taught in, in in high school or college, to a certain extent, maybe to a in the past, hopefully not so much in the present, um, but if certain types of English or certain types of stories and certain types of usages of language are are only being put forward, right? Then then the language becomes oppressive, right? But of course, I think you know Shakespeare was not worried about that. The English language was still much, you know, something to be played with. And I think that's exactly what hip hop authors, authors do, right? Hip hop um, artists do, right? They, they need to say something. The English language that we have it now can't say it. I'm gonna find a way to say it. I'm gonna let the language do, I'm gonna make the language do what I need it to do. If I could take, uh, if, if I could take it just a, a bit of privilege here and ask a question. Um, and you made me think about it. So for example, you, you, you cited in your talk, w, Du Bois, Baldwin, Giovanni, Toni Morrison, for me, personal heroes and those that I consider righteous revolutionaries in the struggle for the advancement of people, right? Not black people, not white people, just people. With that tone and, 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 and building on your idea of Shakespeare being a revolutionary, <laughs> here's my question, is how do you suggest that we make Shakespeare matter more relevant to today's change agents, right? It was obviously relevant back in the day. So how do we make it relevant so that today's change agents can see the power that our ancestors and those that came before us saw? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, 
I think for me, and part of this is that, you know, I, I teach Shakespeare very differently than I used to, right? I think when I first started teaching Shakespeare, you know, and again, you know, I, I loved, you know, once it was all said and done, I loved my Shakespeare class. It was great, you know. Um, so this is not, you know, this is, you know, this is not a, a dig on the old ways of teaching Shakespeare in particular. Because again, you know, one of the things that I really found in Shakespeare, the reason that I sort of was latched on to him was that, you know, my, my Shakespeare professor, was able, right, to sort of bring in political thoughts and ideas that were relevant to me in um, the, the, the 90s, <laughs> the mid 90s as a college student, right? And we were sort of reading Shakespeare through that lens. So I think, you know, that's part of still the goal today, right? Is that we sort of have to put Shakespeare in conversation with the stuff that we care about today, right? And that, you know, there is, you know, and th th it is possible. But in the ways in which I have changed my approach to Shakespeare is that now I include these, I include these folks in my Shakespeare classroom, my regular old Shakespeare classroom, right? You know, and I, and on the one hand, I am a sort of historicist by nature. Like I'm really sort of a person like is really interested in putting things in their historical context. Like I like, I like old stuff. Uh, so we, I definitely do all of that. Like, you know, they have to learn about the sort of history of the English stage and they learn about the Tudor monarchy and all that stuff. But I also sort of want the students to know that there is this long history of engagement and using Shakespeare, right? And that, we ha and, that we, and that what makes, if Shakespeare is interesting is that we can do both, right? We understand the ways in which he was, you know, you know problematic. Because there are some plays, you know, that are problematic. They, they were problematic then, they're problematic now too, right? So it's not that Shakespeare was always got it right 100% of the time. Um, but we can learn something even from the ways he got it wrong, right? We can talk about that, like, ugh, you know, that's not so good, Shakespeare. We don't like that. Um, but I, I bring Black writers in particular into my classroom a lot because we can say, well, how does this, how does Baldwin, for example, or how does um, Giovanni, Giovanni is one of my favorites. I, you know, um, she's like, she's like day one. Because she loves to say, like, why are we even still reading Shakespeare? <laughs> why aren't you reading Giovanni, right? Um, why aren't you, like, you know, we have that conversation in my Shakespeare class. Um, but yeah, all that is to say is I think we, we need to put him in conversation with what people are saying about him today. Um, um, as well as, you know, people of color, um, whoever, right? Um, yeah, hope I answered your question. Got a few more questions in the chat. Um, one is we we've heard from Linda Graham, who mentions that they've got a discussion uh, with the Concord Women's Club coming up in November on women's reading groups. So she put some information on that in the chat. Um, and on that same topic, Cabria Baumgartner, Dr. Baumgartner, also of our board, <laughs> asks um, and a fellow professor at UNH, great lecture, Dennis. I have a very specific and selfish selfish question why might early 19th century African-American activists in Boston refer to Macbeth and specifically the ghost of Banquo in their speeches to other black people? Do you think it's a matter of intellectual currency or something revolutionary in Macbeth as Baraka mentioned? Oh, wow. <laughs> That's a, wow, what a question, Professor Baumgart. That's my esteemed colleague who's a real specialist on 19th century New England. Um, well, I mean, I think that, well, I, you know, definitely, I think there's, there's the, the, the cachet, right? But of course, you know, that's, that's so important for um, 19th century and early 20th century folks um, to be able to sort of say, look, I know Shakespeare. Um, you know, that's part of the project of racial uplift. But I do feel that, you know, that these 19th century and these folks are actually really sophisticated readers, right? And they're not picking plays and you know at random right that they're sort of finding in these particular in particular plays um the materials that they need for their particular project so i would actually have to i would need to talk to you more about um, um i guess I, I guess i don't know particular I, I don't know the context you know in which Macbeth is appearing so I, I, i'm going to have a more a conversation with you because now i'm really fascinated but I always feel like, you know, if the thing, you know, but in terms of the ghost of Banquo, right, you know, there's all these questions in the play that are about the, um, 
the legitimate the legitimacy of political power and political authority um you're right you know sort of you know ambition i mean on one hand like this is like your high school like this is like you know <laughs> like i don't think it's saying anything particularly profound about Macbeth. um but the these but the sort of i, I would say this the ways in which that play is I think the supernatural might also be a part of that. I don't know. But the particular engagement with illegitimate versus legitimate forms of power might be something that is particular to that play that 19th century folks in Boston are engaging for their own purposes. I, I imagine but, um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to follow up with you on that because I am really, really interested in that now. So. Maybe we can have a part two and and Dr. Baumgartner will come and tell, tell us about the answer to that question. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> um, we had to uh, see, Trisha, we, we can reserve that for season three. Oh, season that's three. not a black thought. All right. Yes. Cool. It'll be a little meta because it'll be conversations on conversations. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we had, I had another question I, I received in the chat from Brenda, who says she's a fellow New Hampshire Shakespearean of color. And she wants to know if you talk about your experiences um, when you're teaching Shakespeare to mainly white students. Oh, I, not so much, actually. Um, that's a good question. Sometimes I do feel a need to point out the obvious in the room that I'm black, which on the one hand, they already know. <laughs> but, you know, because clearly I, I walk into the room and they can see me. But, you know, but sometimes I've, I've found and, and I can't necessarily give you a particular context in which I've sort of said that. But I but I often do. I, I often do at times have found it useful for me to just to sort of put it out there and sort of put it in the room. Um, a lot of times it comes up, particularly because I'm like, we're going to talk about race and Shakespeare. Right. Um, and, you know, and because we're talking about race and Shakespeare, um, my race affects, you know, sort of informs the way I approach this topic of your race, whether you know it or not, white students um, is affecting the way in which you're approaching the topic. Right. And in fact, Shakespeare's race, you know, one of the things that um, scholars, you know, have like maybe only recently been sort of saying out loud is that Shakespeare was white. You know, like on the one hand, yeah, duh, but it is the type of thing that needs to be said and needs to be acknowledged and you know that as universal as some might say, he is writing from the perspective of a white man in the 16th and 17th century, right? Um, so I sort of, I do wanna make all of that very explicit because I do feel like it informs the conversation. If we sort of put it out there, like let's just be honest, right? We are sort of approaching this text from different perspectives. Um, and as long, you know, I sort of do the whole thing, you know, and as long as we're sort of, you know, being respectful and, you know, and coming from a good place, you know, we can have conversations, we can ask real questions, right? We don't have to get it right all the time. Um, as long as it's a real question, you know, we, we can have, we can have real questions, you know, I don't want people just getting up there and saying stupid stuff, but, <laughs> but, you know, if we're, if we're having a real intellectual conversation, you know, let's have it. We've got um, uh, one more question in the chat. And it's from Andy and Andy asks, Professor Britton, would you say that in the late 19th century, familiarity with the King James Bible from the black church provided a path to Shakespeare? Yes, that's a great, great mm -hmm. comment, right? Um, that um, the, the language of Shakespeare, there, it, it might've been um, accessible, right? So maybe not just the black, so I think, you know, in, in general, right? Uh, but maybe even longer because you know having grown up in the black church there was no there was nothing other than the king james right um you know even to this day there's you know king james reigns supreme <laughs> but i think you're right that the, the language of of the bible right is the language of shakespeare right so um uh, it may not be as foreign um to certain to to, you know, for you know, at least for you know, black people who grew up in the who grew up in the church in which the King James they heard and they read from every Sunday. So yes, I think great, 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 great comment, great, um, great question. That's such an interesting point too to think about. Just like maybe the, the some of the reverence that Americans hold Shakespeare in has to do with that that familiarity with the language of the King James Bible. Mm -hmm. I 
that's super interesting to think about because it isn't you know again it's it's early modern english so it's not natural to everyone to just understand. right right yes yes um we did get a couple more questions we're we're running out of time but i'm gonna see if i can you want me to read this one trisha yeah go for it from, from andrew so um andrew has a question and i'll read it um let's see here he goes i have a question if you feel like answering another in the early 19th century certain famous white american authors resisted Shakespeare because they wanted to get out of the shadow of the sophistic, sophisticated, excuse me, English literary culture. I think either Melville or Hawthorne, don't remember uh, off the top of my head, said that there is more in, sh in Shakespeare's tomb than there ever was in Shakespeare. And I hope that an American Shakespeare was, huh, was being raised on the banks of the Ohio. You talked about Baldwin, but were there other black authors who had mixed or even adversarial views on Shakespeare? Oh yeah, most, most definitely, <laughs> most definitely, right? So, and, and I do see like, you know, there's, you know, even for folks like Baldwin, right? There's always this ambiguity or this sort of ambivalence, right? Because on the one hand, it, it's, it is so, it's impossible to shake, to separate, or it's impossible to fully separate and disentangle Shakespeare from, the histories of, upon which he has been forced upon us, right? And forced upon black people, right? Which came, which is everything from language and education and a um, downgrading and a diminishing and a, you know, denigrating of black experience, black language and black culture, right? So, so I think, you know, even, you know, even though, you know, you know, a lot of, you know, black authors sort of come to terms with him and they're able to find something of interest in them, right? But, you know, but it's always on their own terms. Um, you know, uh, I, so now I, I need some of my African Americanists here, like in the room, just sort of like, you know, and I know that, you know, there are definitely folks who are just like, I, I don't have any time for Shakespeare. I don't have room for Shakespeare in my life, you know, <laughs> um, you know, and I, I know that's out there too, but somebody help me <laughs> think of what, but I think, you know, that's also, that's also August Wilson. I was thinking August Wilson. I was definitely, August Wilson was definitely on my list of people, but uh, thank you. Um, but yeah, that, you know, th there's, you know, a lot of black authors and black folks, they're like, there's enough within African-American African culture to sustain us. We don't need to go outside of African-American culture, African culture to find what we need. Um, so yeah, so, you know, again, there's no uni uh, universal or univocal black approach to Shakespeare. Um, folks sort of find in him what they want, what they need. Um, um, and then folks say, I, I, there's nothing in him I need and I'm, I'm going to look elsewhere, so. Well, thank you everyone for those questions. Uh, those, that was great, that was fantastic. And, and we'll try to, to follow up with some more resources and information. We've got the, the link to the YouTube video um, from the Toni Morrison clip is in the chat, but we'll post that on our website too on the, on the Black Thought page for anybody who missed the audio on that. Uh, and we'll keep you posted if we have some more discussions on this topic uh, later on. So thank you, everyone. I'm going to let Anthony Poor close us out tonight. Well, I don't have much to say other than thank you. And I want to extend our gratitude for joining us tonight. I want to make a big shout out to Dr. Dennis Britton, you know, the man of the hour for sure. Um, really appreciate it. And I'll just close with reminding everybody that our next Black Thought presentation will be on again on Wednesday, November 11th at 6 p.m. Uh, and we'll be talking about reparations, its history, and its impact, and why it's why it's such important now. So, again, thank you so much for joining us in this work. Um, you know, this perspective, the African Americans' perspective, is an American perspective. So, we're so thankful to have you all join us to share um, a bit of this truth with you all tonight. So, thank you so much. Stay healthy out there. We're thinking about y'all, and and blessings. You take care.